my lord. <laughs> Will there be anything else, my lord? <laughs> Thank you, my lord. I didn't wish to disturb you. Not at all. I was only thinking of playing, not intending to play. <laughs> the tone isn't good. The salt air, perhaps? They would be if looked after. There used to be a Broadwood here before the war. Not so glamorous. I didn't know it was meant to be a piano and not a cocktail cabinet. May I order you a cocktail? No, thank you. Lord Bungay, I think. Good morning. Too. She's very modern. Young Mrs. Jennings. Uh, old Mrs. Jennings? The old hotel burned down. Ah, and the old Broadwood. I suppose so. Hmm. What a great pity. But the view of the sea and the cliffs and the air is the same. There's no use moaning about it and groaning about it and going on and on about how things aren't what they were and aren't what they could be and aren't what... Why not? Well, well, one wouldn't get anywhere. Well, one would get, yes. One would get somewhere. But would one want to be there? Clean <laughs> sweep and start again has always been my... my... I tried to make that my... The only sweep I've met was conspicuously sooty. Yes, that's very clever. You have the latest Strand magazine. Bought in the Strand yesterday. Last month they published part one of the new Sherlock Holmes story, Thor Bridge. Quite the best thing is written for I don't know how many years. Part two. But have you finished with it? Practically. That's to say, I finished it, I just haven't begun it. <laughs> Mr. Coward is twitching to talk about it, but on a bound not to until I have found out how the deed was done. The wife killed herself, presumably, and made it look like murder. Do you wish me to tell you? It couldn't be anything else. Even though her body is lying on the bridge, shot through the head and no gun in her hand. Oh yes, I dare say. <laughs> but what about the husband's mistress? Five minutes earlier they were seen quarrelling on the bridge. But everyone calls her a saint. The husband denies she's his mistress. Of course, naturally. Which Sherlock Holmes believes? I can never forget the effect which Miss Dunbar produced upon me. That strong, clear-cut, yet sensitive Dr. Face. Watson, no doubt, polaxed again by the female sex. So she'll be innocent. The only clue is a chip on the underside of the parapet of the bridge. So presumably Mrs. Gibson tied a length of string to the end of a gun. She fastened the other end to something heavy and dangled that over the parapet. When she shot herself, the gun would have flown out of her hand. Sharp crack against the parapet and vanished over the side into the water. Precisely. <laughs> well, I'm most impressed by your deduction, Mrs. Clifford. Room six. Perhaps you should be a detective. 
Scotland Yard once asked Conan Doyle to assist them on a case. He was no help at all. Please do. My husband smokes like a mill chimney. It is a splendid view. in it, but they might as well set sail in its general direction. <laughs> you seem alarmed. No, sir. Don't you feel that? Feel what? <laughs> to be sure. You may be fatigued. No, sir. What it is to have youth on one side, though some prefer to have their youth on top of them. <laughs> <laughs> Bring us two more of your green-eyed goddesses. Very good, sir. A cocktail? How wise. Cyril refuses to say how many sticky liquors go into his shake heart. <laughs> Ambrosia, nectar, a dash of spleen. Ah! Have you managed to crawl your way to the end of Thor Bridge? The wife killed herself. A simple yes or no would suffice. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, old Bungie comes from a family of lava mouths. Do you wish me to give him a clip round the lug off? She wants to make people think the husband's mistress killed her. The story contains a message for us all. Don't frown. Lift an eyebrow. Never frown. He's writing about himself. Conan Doyle's wife shot herself on a bridge. Try my harder. He shot her on a bridge? The first Lady Doyle died from carefully extended ill health 13 years after Sir Arthur fell in love with a younger woman. For 13 years he mewed and moped but didn't dare make her his mistress. He doesn't know he's writing about himself. Keeping personal history out of one's writing requires constant vigilance, Mrs. Clifford. Blink, and the little clues pop out. A hop, skip, and a jump. Sir Arthur blinked and blinked, and out they pour like bats from the sinking belfry. The wife is outgrown and refused to abandon. The impatience for her death had turned to hatred. The abuse that Mrs. Clifford Gibson hurls against her husband's mistress is the abuse he has hurled against himself. And it is for all the world to read the unspoken wish that his wife should have killed herself 13 years ago before his brain turned into a donut. Because she didn't, he's all but killed his genius. And this is its swan song. Lady Doyle may not have grasped the fact that she ought to kill herself to make her husband happy. His crime was to go on living with her. The crime for a man to live with his wife. The crime was committed against himself. Once he was a man of action, as you can tell from his bulging adverbs. For 13 years he has written rubbish because he's turned himself into rubbish. 
Better one last song than silence. How much better a song cycle year after year? Thor Bridge, Voltan Bridge, Brunhilde Bridge. What is this message for us all? Watch your tongue. I shall write a detective story myself and set it on this island. At high tide, Mrs. Brainwaring was alive and pruning the hot breeches before the ferry arrived and Andalusia Radio was found sticking out of her midriff. No one has left the island, says the funny little detective who has come there to <laughs> examine the amorous habits of the puppy or, or, or the guillemot or the penguin. I doubt that anyone will find penguins where there are more breeches. It is the vital clue. To bring the Montbretius to flower, the rhizomes are sprayed with the Patagonian fertilizer to which Mrs. Brainwaring was allergic. The only person to know this was... Tono, are you flirting with a hired hand? <laughs> no, surely. I doubt that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. My lord. We should never have come to this rock. I understand why Napoleon died on such a leader. <laughs> you exaggerate. The Enterprise had disaster written all over it. You should have taken the trouble to say so. How possibly were you determined to come here and pick up seaweed? <laughs> Having traded your cigarette lighter for crabs. <laughs> Please. I must away. Mr. Coward, I cannot pretend I care for your views on marriage. They are my honest views, Mrs. Clifford. Mrs. Arabelle Clifford. I know it's bad form to read no tell register, but I never resist the chance to look at a little light fiction. I generally assign myself Nicholas Copernicus. On special occasions, <laughs> Natasha Chekhov. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Arabelle Clifford. How perfectly fatuous. She's gone plodding off to see how long it would take a murderer to carry a corpse from here to the smuggler's cove on the other side. And if you cannot take that glint from your eye, she'll make the murderer a you. Are you certain she is who you think she is? Not the iota of a doubt. What game do you suppose she's playing? Tracking somebody. Who knows her name but not her face? I knew her name and face. When the sketch serialised her stories, it spattered its pages with photographic images of the authoress at home, with her daughter, the smile indulgent, with pipe-smoking husband, the smile dutiful, with her trusty corona, ears pricked to catch the pipings of her muse. <laughs> Tracking who? The husband's mistress. Too obvious. Twice I gave her cue to crumble at the knees and cry, it's a fair cop gun. <laughs> She knows she's been rumbled, but will not climb down from her rumble. She's in hiding. Better. From Mr. Christie, who is a false expert. She plays with her wedding ring. Oh, she wants to leave him. No. He wants to leave her. Then why is she hiding? He wants to murder her. She wants to murder him. Then why is she hiding? So she can't murder him. <laughs> These are deep waters, and we've been proven to come without our bathing costumes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has come off the boat. Oh, spare me. <laughs> Mum. Queen Mary. Getting warm. Dear Ivor, why would Ivor come here? Ned was telling everyone within screeching distance of the prowess of some chunky gammy. Cyril, or his mate. He was talking of Gerard with the Metropole. The nigger boxer with the Vaseline eyelids. Are oh, the Ivor's tumbler of punch? Ivor wasn't there. Why are we talking of him? Gerard? Ned? I sometimes think you only talk to fill up the air. I don't believe I can ever forgive you that remark. Certainly I should make no effort to forget. Fill up the air. <laughs> I do forgive you. And I've forgotten. But you do see why we should have gone somewhere else. In Paris I could have typed my fingers to the bone while you dangled your feet in the same. You look so comely, with the light just catching the tilt of your nose, filling up the air. <laughs> come, come, none of that. We can leave if you like. Now, yes, let's go. No, no, no. I'd like us to. Cyril would be disappointed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why am I not at ease? We can be in Paris this time tomorrow. We'll stay at the Valois again. Sit at the window table with the Corpinard. You are an unreformed sentimentalist. <laughs> it's perfectly engaging. I must apologize, sir, the condition of the nuts. They are definitely below the par. Send them by condolences. And some fruit. <laughs> it's the sea air, sir. The salt effloresces and makes a mockery of our endeavors. This pistachio is delicious. It's good of you to say so, sir. In my heart of hearts, I know you only do it to be kind. 
<laughs> no, no, he is a bunny. And so are you. And so am I. And what friends are about to join the Warren? J Boy. Tono. No. Oh, good God. Dickie, we're too late. How long have you been here, you wrote? Yesterday. Oh, I was home. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Cyril! Shouldn't you be on your boat? Chip, no. Yeah. We can play that game that Eddie showed us. One of us says a word, and the next one says the first word to come into his head. Why? Valley. What? <laughs> <Do> I... <laughs> you stop that nonsense, too. <laughs> it's divine to see you, Dickie. And you, J-Boy. What's the mask to hear? Why sneak it? Sightseeing. Bobby Ann Strava says there is something spectacular on premises. Who can invent? Dennis is visiting his mum in Exeter, but Cyril is on show. Talk of the angel. Milo. Whiskey and soda. No soda. Say. <laughs> <laughs> Two more cocktails? <laughs> Certainly. Milo. Put the old there the highest point of the island. Plymouth is clearly visible. Devonport is sometimes visible. Cape Trafalgar is clearly invisible. Mm, what did Bobby Anstruther tell you about it? The usual bosh. Colossal in every quarter. Complacent in every bed. That doesn't surprise me. He meant complacent. He meant completely, complexly companionable. <laughs> I should really be somewhere else, but I'm not there. I'm here. Very sad. I really do feel I ought to be there. Not <laughs> sure not. No, I've come here with you. <laughs> to see I don't know what. You do know what. I do know what. But do I want? Yes? Yes! <laughs> or no. Or yes. Ed Wiener was in tip-top form at Dodo's on Tuesday. In silver lame and a garnet rose outshining even Dodo. Who forgot she'd invited the Grand Duke and wore Bolshevik red from top to toe. No great distance upon Dodo. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, please remember that the Imperial family is my family. The late Tsarina was the youngest of my mother's sisters and the Princess of Hesse. Maria Fedorovna, the late Tsar's paternal grandmother, was the sister of my paternal grandfather <laughs> and of my mother's paternal grandfather, who were of course brothers. Dicky, you clamber around your family tree like a top someone in the rigging. <laughs> Land graves ahoy! <laughs> Edwina and I are jolly madly in love. To be sure. Until marriage puts an end to all that, you and J-Boy can jostle for Cyril's glad eye. <laughs> Until marriage puts an end to all that. <laughs> Commander Anstrava sends his fond regards. It's good of him to remember me, sir. You gave him a weekend to remember. <laughs> I wouldn't have called it weak, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's come over the working classes. All of us jauntier than we used to be. <laughs> You're quite absurd, no. We all work nowadays. Every day at my Indian tour with the Prince of Wales, we had to entertain some tuppenny hippie Maharaja. We returned with trunks of booty. Ivory boxes, gold dishes, gold daggers. I could stab 27 lovers and leave a gold dagger in each. <laughs> You'd have loved the little Indians. They wriggle. Noel and I will set sail on Tuesday. What? No, I want to the wedding. Of course. What shall I give you to stab into a greener? Uh. <laughs> I think that part of the job's up to me. <laughs> She's a very special person, though. Very special. You make her sound like a white elephant. Really special. I'm a horribly lucky fellow. Everything's going along all right. It's so thrilling. When I think about Audrey, she was so tawdry. What is Edwina? Is so much keener. In her arena. Like a hyena. But obscene. On the other hand, do you suppose you'd feel Serena to quarantine her? Or in the last resort, abruptly guillotine her? No, she's really just the right person for me. <laughs> we have a mysterious creature staying here. Who, oh Lord? Who? She signed Register, Arabelle Clifford, but no one swears she's really someone called Agatha Christie. Who? A writer of useful guidebooks on how to kill your wife and be caught. No, Agatha Christie, is she here? No one recognised her from some photographs. I never forget a celebrity. Evidently she has no wish to be a celebrity, or not here and now. Why not? But that's incredible. Perhaps some using to find out. No. She's no fool. Foolish. There'll be some crack in her armour. Don't stop talking. Oh, sorry, but this is important, isn't it? It's providential. Right. Because I've invented an absolutely brilliant idea for a detective story. Set on an island. What? No. There are the footprints of a gigantic mummy. Please. 
Nobody's ever thought of a story as good as this. Don't look like that. It's true. It is. You see, detective stories always have to have someone who tells the story, don't they? My idea, which is truly bloody brilliant, came during a durbar at indoor when the prince had to smile and chat and nod and greet this procession of rajas. All he wanted to do was go off and write another love letter to Freddy. Oh. Frida. Oh, no. Frida. <laughs> but there he was, trapped. Wonderful to meet you. Splendid to meet you. So interesting to meet you. Into my head popped this incredible idea. I don't have the time to write it, but she could, and I was just about to write her a letter. Tomorrow! Tomorrow, and here she is. Don't you recognize quite extraordinarily extraordinary? Dickie, if you don't reveal your bloody idea quickly, I shall die of patience. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's this. The chap who tells the story, the Dr. Watson chap, he commits the murder. How can he? Because he's telling the story. He can put in what he wants, leave out what he wants. He leaves out it was he killed the vicar in the library in chapter one, and how he killed the frightful millionaireess in chapter two. And in the last chapter he writes, well, I hate to say it, but the game's up. Monsieur Poirot, Poirot turned to me this afternoon and said, my friend, you are the guilty one. <laughs> it's never been done before, ever. Ever. You read a book and you suspect all the people except the man who's telling the story. You have to trust him. You do trust him. But he is the murderer. Dickie, you astonish me. More than that, you bewilder me. What led you to dream up such a treacherous idea?